Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are happy to, to have you here. Uh, this is the uh, official kickoff of the webinar series for the agronomic crops team. Uh, we hope you you enjoyed uh, the presentations that our speakers uh, are gonna have prepared and are gonna prepare for the rest of the year. Uh, as a reminder, <clears throat> our webinars have been scheduled for the second Tuesday of each month, uh, starting at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, these webinars are going to be recorded, so uh, if you cannot uh, make it um, for that day and that time, uh, you will be able to uh, watch the presentations later and also uh, these presentations are going to be available so you can share those with the farmers in your area, in your area or if you schedule uh, other meetings. Uh, with that said, I will <coughs> introduce uh, two of the speakers of this morning, Dr. Keith Falcon from USDA ARS and Mark Rangi, Max Rangi from <coughs> the Department of Ag Economics. Uh, we also are going to have uh, Dr. Astin Hagan from presenting from Tuscaloosa. Uh, Dr. Joyce Ducar uh, was scheduled also for this morning, but she's currently traveling, traveling to Tuscaloosa, so we don't know if she will be able to make it on time. Otherwise, we will make her presentation available uh, at the end of this uh, week. So with that said, I will uh, let uh, Dr. Balcon to start with his presentation. Okay. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, obviously, the topic today is uh, nitrogen management for Alabama wheat, and I certainly want to recognize uh, someone here that was instrumental in working with this project, Charlie Burmeister. He's retired, obviously, but uh, he certainly helped with uh, you know setting up this project and kind of coming up with uh, the questions and what we were trying to answer. So I want to recognize his efforts uh, for sure. Uh, basically, this work came about. Uh, we started this in 2008, and that was when uh, wheat uh, production was really starting to increase in the state. You can look at this graph and see how it really jumped up to around 200,000 acres and, and stayed fairly steady. Um, and I obviously only kept data to 2014, but that's what led to this work, uh, all the questions that were associated uh, with this type of uh, work uh, for wheat. Now, the background for this was when people were getting back into wheat production, uh, you know, they had a lot of questions about the management practices to maximize their wheat yields. And one of the things is they were interested in conservation tillage practices, and they wanted to know if they needed to uh, apply higher nitrogen rates with these types of systems. And there were concerns related to if you're using conservation systems, would it delay wheat emergence and plant development? And then in addition to the nitrogen rates, they, they were concerned about the timing of applications. So these were kind of the questions that we that helped guide us to set up this experiment um, to, to examine wheat production here in Alabama. And one of the things I think most people recognize this, but I just want to mention it. This is some data that uh, Dr. Charlie Mitchell shared from the color rotation, and it kind of makes a good point. Uh, you know, nitrogen obviously is a can be a limiting factor for wheat production. And you can see there that lime is probably the most limiting factor. Um, but generally, that's not going to be a problem. Most people know to keep their fields lined and so forth. But notice how phosphorus and potassium can be very detrimental for wheat production. So we can talk about trying to maximize nitrogen, uh, you know, correct timing and all those kind of things. But if we don't have the phosphorus and potassium levels correct, it's not going to make any difference. So that's just kind of a reminder uh, for everyone and, you know, to use a general soil test and make sure you correct those problems as well. Um, for the objectives for this, for this research, uh, we looked at uh, determining the level of tillage necessary to optimize wheat yields and then determine the optimum nitrogen fertilizer, fertilizer rates and timing across these tillage systems. And this little picture here, um, and I should have referenced, I can't remember where exactly it came from, but it was something from the Extension Service. But you can see, you know, we, we have uh, a high concentration of wheat. Each one of those dots represents a, a certain number of acres. We have a high concentration in North Alabama, some in Central Alabama, and then a good um, distribution across Southeast and Southwest Alabama. So fortunately, in the uh, Alabama Extension uh, System, our experiment station system, we have locations that correspond to those areas. 
So we set up this, this project in each of those four locations at Tennessee Valley, E.B. Smith, Wiregrass, and Gulf Coast. And so we have four different soil types, and we did this for 12 uh, site years. So we have a pretty robust data set to, to take a look at this information for uh, tillage and nitrogen. And I certainly don't want to imply that this is the end-all test for wheat and nitrogen. It just happens to be the latest information that we have related to wheat, wheat and nitrogen in Alabama. Um, like I said, we did have 12 site years, but unfortunately we had to drop three of those years. And I'll tell you the reason why. At Tennessee Valley, we had head scab that hit up there. And the yields were down. They weren't as bad as what you would think, but they were low for Tennessee Valley. And obviously, we just didn't want a chance uh, any kind of differences associated with the scab versus our treatment. So we threw that one out. We had a bad choice on a variety at Gulf Coast. We had one that was planted with a long vernalization period. And obviously, we were not going to get that at Gulf Coast. So we threw that one out. And then at Wiregrass, we had an area that was extremely sandy area, and it was low in phosphorus. And unfortunately, even though all the several people communicated that we need to put phosphorus out, I don't think it ever got put out because our yields were like, the highest were like 20 bushels to the acre. So we just didn't use that, obviously. We didn't want to um, confound our results with that. So these are the nine site years that we wound up with. Uh, you can see the first one was at Tennessee Valley, obviously initiated in the fall of 2007. You can see the soil series, the cultivar that was used, the planting date, and the harvest date for these nine uh, site site years, just to give you an idea of what we what we were dealing with and how uh, planting dates and harvest dates corresponded. Now, our design we used was just a simple split plot design. We had a tillage system as the main plot. We used conventional tillage or non-inversion. And with non-inversion, we used what that's in this picture here on the top left, that KMC uh, subsoil uh, leveler. And basically, it eliminates deep, deep compaction, but it also maintains some residue on the soil surface. And then at Tennessee Valley, because we were dealing with a different soil type up there, a little bit heavier, we, we looked at straight no-tillage there. And then for our subplots, we had 12 different combinations of nitrogen rates. And this included, uh, we had some fall application where we used granular fertilizer, and then we came back in the spring with typically a 28% um, UADN solution. And you notice here, we had 12 different uh, nitrogen rates by four replications, that's 48 plots times two tillage treatments, that's 96. So each one of these tests was very large tests. There was a lot of labor associated with these tests, um, but I, you know, I feel like it did generate some good information for us. Um, the treatments here, this just gives you a list of 12 different treatments and application times. You can see we looked at fall applied nitrogen uh, with zero or either about 20 pounds. We possibly could have went a little bit higher than that, but obviously we didn't want to burn the wheat or anything. Um, so we, and then we split up uh, rates across uh, feed four or feed six growth stages. And basically we just looked at three different rates there, 60, 90, and 120 pounds. 90 being our recommended, 60 would be a low, and then 20 would be just a high. And then we split those up and you can see the combinations of, sometimes we split them over the growth stages, sometimes, uh, and then when we applied uh, fall nitrogen, we just made up the difference either at feet four or at feet six. And for those of you, just to remember, uh, reminder, feet four uh, is approximately, in, in the test that we were doing here and the conditions we had, it was, feet four was occurring approximately around uh, early to mid-February. And maybe a look, you know, a week, maybe a couple of weeks later at Tennessee Valley, but that was roughly the time frame. And then feed six would come in about a month after that, approximately. So that shows you kind of our, our times of application. Uh, this is just a picture from Wiregrass, kind of shows one of the one of the locations. Uh, you can see we did have a lot of lot of variability in the in the, uh, in, the in the experiment as far as you know, very green plants to, to very obviously nitrogen deficient plants. So you know, there was definitely some, some differences we observed across this experiment. Uh, one of the things that we looked at, is, and which is obviously important in wheat, is, is tiller data. We counted these tillers at the uh, FIX4. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the uh, tiller work that's been done in North Carolina, uh, where people are using those to help guide uh, nitrogen fertilization. And we were trying to take a look at that. So that's why we wanted to count the tillers as well. But if you take a look at these effects here, tillage and fall nitrogen, you know, because fall in was the only thing that would have been applicable uh, for, tiller, for tiller data at that time because no nitrogen was put on until after we counted the tillers. But notice how for the tiller, tillage data, 
the Tennessee Valley. Uh, there's actually no effect uh, among uh, tiller data for, for the tillage, no effect there, and, and very little effect on the coastal plain soils. Um, and we had one location that actually conventional tillage favored uh, more tillers, but it was not uh, certainly not a consistent uh, uh, effect that we saw for uh, tillage and tillers. Now, for the nitrogen, fall nitrogen, it was imperative. If you notice at Tennessee Valley, we didn't see we didn't see any benefit, which basically says to me there is some residual nitrogen that we're getting on those soils up there. Um, you know, and generally we don't we don't account for residual nitrogen on for soil tests in Alabama. And uh, you know, in this case, I think we did see a little bit, but I think it had to do with because it was in the fall. If you went back and and you know, if you were planting a crop in the spring, that nitrogen might have been denitrified or leached over the winter and it probably would not have been there. But because of the timing of when we planted the, the crop, you know, we did see a little bit of benefit. But then if you notice on the coastal plain soils, each one of these where the X is, it was obviously highly significant. The fall applied in was extremely important to promote tiller production on these sandier soils. And that and, and you know that's kind of intuitive. That's what we expect. It kind of confirms some of the stuff that we have observed in the past. Um, when we take a look at tiller counts, we, like I say, we were trying to see if we could see any kind of relationship with this, and we, we uh, look at that compared to the wheat yields, and there is a relationship, but it's still, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of variability that we explained about 50% of it, but notice how, you know, we'd like to see a maximum that occurs maybe down, you know, more in this range would be more what you would be looking for. Our, our maximum occurred way over here, probably maybe 175 tillers per square foot, which is really uh, a large number. Uh, some of those, I mentioned the work in North Carolina, and you know they'll use a cutoff of say somewhere around 50 tillers per square foot, roughly. And you know we, just, if you look at that, look how much variability we had. Or even if you go to 100, you know we had some that were down at 35 bushels to the acre. And then we had some all the way up to 110. So what that's saying is, obviously, there's a lot of things that can happen to those tillers from the time you count them to the time you actually harvest. You can't just guarantee that you have tillers in the spring that you're going to guarantee a, a, a yield um, in the end. And so, again, we've tried to compare this with some different things, looking at nitrogen concentration of those tillers. And you can see no relationship there. Um, and then, of course, we looked at nitrogen concentration and weed yield because we had it, but you, you really don't want to do this even if there was a relationship because it's going to be time consuming. You're going to have to collect the tillers, dry them, grind them, get them analyzed, which is kind of defeating the whole purpose. That's the beauty of the tiller counts is you can go out, you can do it, a farmer can do it, a crop consultant can do it, go out and get an instant uh, value that then hopefully you, know, you can relate it to some kind of nitrogen rate. That's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to go for. Um, when we look at some of that data, uh, as far as how it how it compared across the locations, uh, as I said, the you know the fall in was imperative. Uh, you see how it increased the tiller density at coastal plain, um, and then the biomass. It also you know we had bigger plants, high health, seemed like healthier plants on the coastal plain. Limestone Valley, uh, you can see there was no effect, but we had more tillers in general at at, at Tennessee Valley. But notice that the plants were much smaller. If you look at that compared to coastal plain, even though there's no difference in biomass, we had smaller plants overall. Um, so that was kind of interesting. We also looked at feet six data because, as I said, we applied some nitrogen at, at feet four, so we kind of wanted to see how this had an effect on the plant growth. And you can see here we looked at the end concentration on the coastal plain, and where we had uh, it was actually lower end concentration on the non-inversion tillage system. But then when you look at the plant biomass, we actually had bigger plants. So this is this is not concerning to me. It's just simply a dilution effect of the nitrogen that was in the plants. Um, and if you take a look at Limestone Valley or Tennessee Valley, uh, you can see we had higher end concentrations, but notice the plant biomass, the plants are smaller. So it's, again, it's that dilution effect, I think. These were not as diluted. So we just had higher, higher end concentrations there. Um, we did have an interaction that we observed with uh, fall nitrogen and, and, and the fix four nitrogen at the coastal plain. And basically it's just showing how with that 20 pounds of nitrogen at the higher end rates, we saw a separation of our uh, plant end concentration, which 
not surprising, but this just kind of helps support some of the you know uh, things that we observe looking at the plant data throughout the growing season. Uh, when we look at coastal plain, we also saw, I'm sorry, actually uh, this is more uh, plant data for both locations. And again, it just it drives home the point of that fall applied nitrogen on the uh, biomass production. You can see it's much greater where we didn't apply any fall nitrogen. Limestone Valley, this was the only time that we, I, I don't really understand this to be honest with you, but it's the only time we saw significant differences in Limestone Valley across any of these treatments. We saw, we did see a nitrogen increase, a nitrogen concentration increase uh, for the fall applied in. And then if you take a look at the, uh, just looking at our spring in rates, that's what I'm calling what we applied at peaks for early in the season. You can see uh, there were some differences, but nothing that justified the high nitrogen, 120 pounds. We did not see uh, a need for that in, in these uh, particular site years that we examined. So, you know, the recommendations were still holding true. We couldn't justify putting on more nitrogen. Um, for the tillage data, uh, this is related to harvest, the yields, and obviously this is, this is averaged over each of the locations, and we broke it out by coastal plain and limestone valley. And you can see where we had non-inversion, we had about a six bushel increase, which is significant. And I think that could be even more significant if you were thinking about where you only had to make one tillage pass and plant versus making multiple tillage passes with conventional operation and you know it would certainly affect your profitability associated with that because you don't have as many trips across the field. You can see the protein levels were a little bit different, uh, actually a little bit lower for the non-inversion but again that was uh, related to that dilution effect that we talked about. And then at Limestone Valley you can see we didn't see any difference but in this case I think that's good. Instead of doing any tillage we can just drop right in there and plant instead of uh, having to do any kind of tillage operation. So the lack of difference there is good. And you can see, you know, we had higher tillers at Tennessee Valley and we also had higher yields uh, also. So it kind of supports that. The crude protein, no real difference there between, between the two at Tennessee Valley. Um, there's more differences observed on the coastal plain sites. And let's go over those very quickly. Uh, you know, again, just showing that 20 pounds of nitrogen, we saw an increase. Uh, the crude protein was lower, but uh, again, it, it's being diluted. I'm not concerned about that. This shows how it was very important to put the nitrogen on at peaks four. You know, early in the season, we needed to have that nitrogen on. Um, and then you see the dilution again. Uh, but again, that's not, to me, a concern. If somebody's trying to maximize the crude protein, then they may want to handle things a little bit differently. But this shows uh, the only case where we saw a justification for 120 pounds is if we, you know it did increase the crude protein of the grain, which it makes sense that it probably take a little bit more nitrogen to increase the in concentration of the grain as opposed to maximizing the uh, grain itself. But again, you see there was no justification for that high nitrogen rate on the uh, on the wheat. Um, this this work has been summarized in other places, and I put this slide up here so you can take a look at it if you want to see it. Some of you are probably familiar with the Better Crops Journal. Uh, it has uh, is put out by IPNI, and if you go to this web link, and it's the year 2011, issue number three. There's kind of a, re a report written up about this experiment, although it was kind of a preliminary uh, report that we provided to those guys because they did provide some funding. If you're a member of Agronomy Society, you can go to Crops and Soils magazine. They have a, a write-up about that particular. Uh, experiment and they actually used it for a uh, CCA training so people could actually do a self-test on it and get CCA credits. And then of course if you really are concerned, it comes from this Agronomy Journal article here that we wrote up related to the, uh, to the work. And I do want to mention one other thing. We talked about uh, tiller counts but you know there's a lot of interest in variable rate in applications and you know that's using the sensors to predict nitrogen rates on the go. A lot of people use uh, the NDVI, the Green Seeker, or some, uh, then there's also the Crop Circle, the Red Edge. You basically use these to develop a yield prediction equation and correlate that with nitrogen rates. And we did take a look at this over all these experiments, and I'll show you the relationship here. It's uh, This is for the Green Seeker data, and this is for a lot of, not just the data that I talk about, but this is for 24 site years of data related to wheat and nitrogen fertility that we've conducted in Alabama. And you can see here that like we, we plant, apply this yield versus this peaks for NSA, and that's basically that stands for in-season yield 
uh, in season estimate of yield. And it's basically the NDVI divided by the growing degree to age from the time it was planted to the time you did the uh, sensing. And so you can see there might be a relationship there, but I'm not ready to put it out there and show anybody yet. Um, but we could take that information and possibly develop some kind of algorithm to help us with on the go nitrogen fertilization as the goal. And then we also looked at the crop circle data. This is, uh, you know, we didn't have as many locations, but you can see it, we, I kept it on the same scale. You can see how it's, it's you know, it's a little bit more sensitive, a little bit smaller. Uh, the values are a little bit smaller. But, you know, this one looks like a straight linear relationship. You really want to see some kind of plateau there to, to know that you've reached a maximum. Um, so with that, just to summarize, you know, the non-inversion no tillage produced comparable yields to conventional tillage across Alabama. The fall applied in was essential for coastal plain soils, but not on the limestone valley. Totally unapplied by FIX4 was necessary to optimize yields on the coastal plain. And the tiller data was not successful to predict end requirements under these conditions. Now, one of the things, you know, I want to touch on that. We talked about North Carolina, and they've had some success with this. They're a little bit different latitude than us. And I'm wondering if maybe we should have been counting our tillers maybe a little bit earlier. For example, maybe we need to be counting tillers right now instead of waiting until February. And maybe that could have made a little bit of difference. I'm not sure, but I don't have any data, obviously, to, to support that. But based on you know, what we saw, I was just curious that that might be a, a solution. And then at Limestone Valley, you know, we just had a lot more. There was obviously factors that in this study that... Uh, or control the weed yield, and it wasn't the nitrogen and the tillage uh, for that particular location. And I certainly want to thank the financial support provided by the Alabama Weed and Feed Grain Commission and uh, IPNI, and, and thank the uh, technical support staff at ARS and the experiment stations. And I guess I want to give enough questions or I'll put it before we are moving. Yeah, but, but that concludes my presentation. Does anyone have questions? I have sort of a question for you, um, Kim. It, in regards to our Hessian flies, one of the effects that it has is it reduces the number of tillers you have per square foot. And um, in our publication, we have uh, a little bit of thing about if you have like more than 20% of your tillers infested with Hessian fly. Um, don't put the nitrogen on, you know, because probably your yield potential, your chance of yield potential is going to be low. Yeah. So, um, and sort of thinking about this reduced tillers and infestation levels, and in terms, what kind of guidance would you have in terms of what you found out about do you put putting on the nitrogen? I mean, when do you think you would just abandon the field? Can you can you can you kind of make a guesstimate on that? Um, I know. I mean, I know your dots were all over the place, but yeah, and that's it, what makes you nervous. But I really it's don't have to put nitrogen on. I know. I don't have a good. Um, I don't have a good answer because really the you know if you had uh, a low number of tillers, then that would tell me that I need to be putting the nitrogen on. You know, I need to be trying to uh, salvage what I can there in terms of like if I had a high number. We may be thinking we want to back off on the nitrogen as far as at that particular growth stage. So it's it's hard for me to say uh, what would be the ideal you know cutoff level um, for when you know when to just say we're not going we're not going to put any out. I think uh, you know hopefully if you had fall if you put some fall applied in uh, you know you, you'd be able to see that the nitrogen was was having some effect on your uh, on the tillers and so forth and go from there. But. I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I have to think about that one some more. But. Okay. Yeah, because it, it just suddenly occurred to me as I was listening to you talk. It's like, well, yeah, that's sort of a similar thing because I will sort of say, you know, give this recommendation based on the regressions that David Button had done about, you yeah. know, what your potential yield looks like based on your percent mm -hmm. invested tillers at the time yeah. you put, you know, in this early, early winter. You know, so I was Well, and see, I think wondering. like you're talking about tillers that are, they're damaged and they're not going to come. You know, they're, they're yeah, that's on top of the ones that they don't. They even reduce the number of tillers you can right. have per square foot. So right. that's another story. But yeah, so, so, see, so we're just looking at damaged tillers and not looking at total number when I make my recommendation. But I suddenly got to thinking about yeah, and it could be my mentality to to because my 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 mentality is if we don't have enough tillers, then we need to put some more nitrogen out there to get them going. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's kind of yeah. we're coming at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's hard for me to say which yeah what would be the right number. 